Hi everyone, this is a revision video for Mrs Sisyphus by Caroline Duffy. This is for the AQA qualification in English literature using Spec B, uh, more specifically using comedy and using the comedic anthology, which is a collection of seven poems from seven different poets across the centuries. Um, there are videos for other poems as well in my YouTube um, back catalogue, so please do go and have a look at the uh, poetry playlist, which this video is part of as well. Um, so the aims of this session are quite simple, really. Um, I've done it before for the other poems as well. It's to analyse the poem for AO2, which is authorial methods. Uh, I'm going to start by referring to key literary concepts and terms for AO1. Um, I'm then going to move on to AO3, which is the social and historical context. And then finally, at the end of this, of this uh, video, is to link the text to the comedic genre, because with A-level, we are looking at these texts through the lens of a comedy genre. So we don't just need to know the text really well, but we also need to know the comedy tradition um, in which those texts um sit which they belong to okay so that is the um, aims of this video so for this poem this poem uh, could be described as being revisionist and when something is revisionist it means it's revising something so because in this poem duffy is taking an old greek myth of sisyphus um, she is giving this myth a new perspective and she's updating it for modern readers really um, Many of us don't know what it's like, I should say most of us don't know what it's like to be punished to push up a boulder up a hill for eternity. Um, but we do know perhaps what it's like to know or be in a relationship with a workaholic. So by having a revisionist text, Duffy is updating it and making it, I suppose, more understandable to us as readers in the 21st century. Another key term is workaholic because Sisyphus, the husband in this poem, uh, is working all the time and is married to his job. It's not really a job. It's only a job when you look at what he's doing from a modern perspective. We also have use of masculine rhyme in this poem, particularly at the end of the first stanza, where you have monosyllabic stressed rhymes. So monosyllabic means one syllable. So the ending words of the first stanza in this poem are examples of masculine rhyme. Uh, Duffy's style, her register in this poem is also quite colloquial at times. She, the, the wife, Mrs Sisyphus, who is the speaker of the husband, um, often uses quite informal language and slang, calling him names, um, dismissing really his effort and dismissing his, um, his uh, I suppose, approach to his work. The poem could also be called relatable because um, we might know what it's like to be married or we might know what it's like to know or be in a relationship with somebody who seems to put their work before their family or us. And that can result in tension sometimes. And that's certainly the driving force of dysfunctionality in this marriage, in this poem, is because of the work. And finally, we could also say the language is quite anachronistic. Um, which means that we have quite modern phrases, quite modern, um, you know, expressions and registers with sitting within an older context. So obviously, uh, during the time of this myth, uh, we would not have characters talking in the way that Mrs. Sisyphus talks in this poem. And that is also part of it being revisionist and updating it and, and helping us understand how I suppose um, Duffy is almost comically undercutting um, this Greek myth. So by using those terms in bold there you would get AO1 but then by using those terms uh, to express meanings or to help interpretations you would also be getting AO2, 3 and 5 as well. So the AOs, the assessment objectives often blur into one another. Uh, you can hit multiple AOs um, by saying um, one thing really. Um, so it's quite um, easy to hit multiple AOs um, quite quickly. AO3, the social and historical context. So like we've said really, Duffy uses the myth of Sisyphus to examine the theme of dysfunctional marriages and you will often find in many comedies, whether that be on television or in movies or in other um, pieces of literature, that the dysfunctionality between couples 
um, in their marriage um, can be the reason why we, we laugh at them. Um, in Greek myth, Sisyphus was punished for deceitfulness by Zeus and was sentenced to push an immense boulder up a hill for eternity. And of course, all it would do is roll back down again and he would have to repeat it again and again and again. So this idea that his work is very futile, he has really no aims to his work. He doesn't seem to be achieving anything. And that's partly why Mrs. Sisyphus, the speaker, is, is quite fed up, really, because he's working and slogging his guts out, um, working, pushing this boulder up the hill, but not really achieving anything. There's no perks to the job, it seems, despite him saying there are. So he's, he's presented as quite foolish, really. So Duffy modernises um, the arduous and never-ending task of pushing the boulder up the hill by linking it to a workaholic, um, a term that was coined in the 1960s, the, the, the word workaholic. So it's quite a new word in respects to others. Um, hasn't been around that long. Um, and that's the reason why we can, I suppose, relate to this. And comedy is always about relatability. We often relate more to comedy than we do tragedy. Duffy is also known as a feminist writer, and this poem comes from a collection she published in 1998 called The World's Wife. And if you look at the titles of the poems in that collection, many of them start with the prefix Mrs. Uh, and I suppose follow the same pattern of looking at quite notable historical figures and reworking them from a, from a feminist perspective. Um, here in this poem, same thing, we have quite an empowered female speaker. And often you will find, if you study history as well, that history often is about powerful or successful men. Um, but what Duffy is doing in this poem is she's really asking, well, what happened to the women in those men's lives when they, while they were achieving victory and while they were achieving a name for themselves and being victorious, what happened to their wives? Were they sidelined in, in the darkness at, at the sides of, of that greatness so the men could be brilliant? What happened to the women? And, and that's really what Duffy is doing with Mrs. Sisyphus as well as other poems in that collection in 1998 from which this comes from. So that's all AO3. So for AO2 then, we need to start annotating the poem. So the first stanza begins with, that's him, pushing the stone up the hill with jerk. I call it a stone, it's nearer the size of a kirk. When he first started out, it just used to irk, but now it incenses me and him, the absolute burk. I could do something vicious to him with a dirk. So you can hear that it's that masculine rhyme at the end, jerk, kirk, irk, burk, dirk, are all masculine rhymes. They obviously, they, they, they sound quite heavy because they're monosyllabic. And you could say that maybe captures her bitterness, it captures the speaker's irritation. But it could also emphasise the arduous task of pushing this boulder up the hill forever um, and, and how she feels about that. A dirk is a knife and a kirk is a church. That's examples of Scottish dialect there, Duffy being Scottish. And the way she starts it, just by saying that's him, you know, you can imagine her being quite fed up and almost like a dismissive eye roll, as if to say, you know, that's him, kind of really quite fed up and being quite comically dismissive, as if he's a bit of a fool, a bit of a buffoon. Um, and obviously what she calls him, a jerk, a, an absolute burk, the fact that she wants to almost um, stab him with a knife there, I, I don't think literally just being, you know, just being a little bit annoyed, quite hyperbolic, shows how irritated she is and how bitter she is and how she completely undermines uh, Sisyphus's hard work and labour. Um, and she's irritated, annoyed and angry because she feels neglected. Obviously, like I said, this language is very anachronistic. It's, it's very colloquial. She's not a typically doting or caring wife concerned about her husband's welfare. Uh, she seems to think that his work is a choice rather than a, than a sentence for punishment. And the language is also quite anachronistic because obviously it's quite modern language to us to hear these words. They would not have been used at the time of the Greek myth first being um, you know, written or spoken. So again, the language is quite modern as well, and that increases the sense of relatability. As we move into the kind of the middle stanza, quite a long stanza, he, she says, think of the perks, he says. So she's almost mimicking him um, as if she feels that he's talking nonsense, because in her mind, there is no perks. And if he, even if he did have perks, what's the point of them? 
if you can't celebrate together or enjoy the fruits of your labour. She says, what use is a perk, I shriek, when you haven't time to pop open a cork or go for so much as a walk in the park? So for her, there is a lack of perks, really. What's the point in working these long hours if there's nothing to show for it? Um, and she just simply dismisses him in that very colloquial end stopped uh, declarative. He's a dork. You can't really, um, you know, get a clearer sign of her feelings about him. Again, very colloquial, very dismissive, very annoyed. Folk flock from Mars around just to gawk. So people seem to, to watch Sisyphus and, and seem to maybe laugh at him and gawk at him because of his stupidity in working these long hours for no real reason. She maybe feels embarrassed that he becomes a spectacle to be laughed at. They think it's a quirk, a bit of a lark. A load of old bollocks is nearer the mark. Um, so again, that, that kind of very colloquial dismissive tone calling you know, this whole thing a load of old bollocks um, just goes to show how dismissive um, she is. And she says he might as well bark at the moon. That's how futile and how pointless this boulder job is um, for him. There are other sayings as well that suggest, um, you know, things are a waste of time. You might as well, something in the wind, for example, is another one. So there's a whole sense here of futility and, and how she sees his work completely differently to how he does. Um, and again, that feckin' stone is no sooner up than it's rolling back all the way down. So again, really, she's really quite pissed off here, isn't she? And she's really quite um, dismissive of the stone and how that stone really is, is ruining her marriage, it seems, and, and creating that dysfunctionality in the marriage. And no sooner is it back at the top than it's rolling back down again and he's got to do it again. Okay. And she says, and what does he say? Mustn't shirk, keen as a hawk, lean as a shark, mustn't shirk. So we've got there some kind of two similes uh, using hawks and sharks uh, and reported speech, things that he's probably said to her at some point or another. But she's quite sarcastic and mocking that um, because, you know, she's mocking that sense of duty he has in his work. And she's getting quite annoyed with it because he never takes a day off. He never spends time with her. So very annoyed. And towards the end of the poem, the last bit, really, it sums up why she feels the way she does. But she says, because I lie alone in the dark, but I lie alone in the dark. So that fronted conjunction, but at the beginning of the line, conveys her neglect and loneliness. We might feel sympathy for her at this point, despite her being quite comic in her tone and register. Clearly, she does feel neglected and she does blame his lack of, um, I suppose, choice in not wanting to work for change. and Instead, to spend time with her, she kind of mocks that loyalty to his job. Um, so she's lying alone in the dark and then she alludes to Noah and the composer uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. And the reason why she's referring to those two well-known people in, in obviously, in myth, I suppose, is because they're two well-known male figures. And what she's asking, really, what Duffy is asking through the voice of Mrs. Sisyphus, were their wives neglected while they achieved greatness? So while Noah was hammering away at the ark in his garage, let's say, <laughs> with um, all of his wood and his tools, um, what, was what was his wife doing? Um, was she also neglected and, and, you know, forced into silence and triviality and, and obscurity because of her lack of importance, perhaps? Same thing with, with back there. She says, my voice is reduced to a squawk, a, my smile to a twisted smirk. So things like squawks and twisted smirk, things that are quite small, you know, that we've got that verb twisted there, which means that she's quite bitter, quite angry, but she can't do anything about it. So in effect, she's powerless. Uh, and obviously a squawk is quite a, is quite a um, I suppose, a, a small sound as well. So even her resentment is quite futile as well. And she says, while upon the deepening uh, murk of the hill, he is giving 100 percent and more to his work. And that word work is kept until the last line of the poem. All of these words like burk and squawk and smirk are all kind of rhymes or half rhymes to that word work. And that work word is obviously the, 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 the central issue of this dysfunctionality in this comic poem. It's the work that's the problem. 
because he's always choosing to work over spending time with her. Alternatively, you could say, well, it's not his fault. He was punished. This is a sentence. He has no choice. So you might say you feel actually sorry for, for Sisyphus as well. He's also a victim here and get into a discussion about who is the victim. Is it Mrs. Sisyphus or is it the husband? And that could get for that could get you some, I suppose, some AO5 there for some differences in interpretations. So that word work is kept till last um, because that is, I suppose, the, the, you know, the issue that the um, this poem is about. So what aspect of comedy do we see? So this is now moving into AO4. Remember, we need to be able to link the poem to the comedic genre. So we see dysfunctional relationships between husband and wife. We have the sarcasm, the colloquialisms and the mimicry from her voice for AO2 there. The rivalry between uh, Mrs Sisyphus and her husband. But I also think as well between, I suppose, Mrs Sisyphus and the boulder almost. Um, so there's a rivalry there coming through. A lack of a happy resolution. This poem does not uh, is not consistent with comedy generally, which has a happy resolution. The idea that the problem of this poem will last far longer than the poem itself. So there is no happy resolution here. He doesn't just, you know, leave his job one day and come home to spend time with her. There's a sense that this problem will continue far beyond the end of the poem. Female empowerment. Uh, she's quite empowered in her speaking, although she's also quite powerless in the sense she can't do anything about it other than moan. She's quite outspoken. You could say that maybe Sisyphus is quite arrogant when he says things like think of the perks, mustn't shirk and so on. Maybe he's quite of a, you know, maybe he's posturing there. Maybe he's a bit egotistical, perhaps. Maybe he's arrogant enough to dismiss his wife's suffering, perhaps. Alternatively, maybe he's aware of it, but can't do anything about it, perhaps. As I said at the beginning, there's a degree of relatability. We don't know what it's like to have a job of maybe pushing a big boulder up a hill forever. Um, thank goodness. But we do know what it's like perhaps to be uh, in a relationship with a workaholic or know somebody who is. And that means that we have relatability. The way in which Sis, uh, Mrs Sisyphus speaks as well, there's a degree of asides here. The way in which kind of the speaker almost seems to be talking directly to us. So there's a sense that she's kind of, you know, kind of doing eye rolls but also talking to us directly in her kind of very dismissive way and you could also say for AO4 that this poem is all about ridiculing human weakness and foibles and foibles are kind of shortcomings comedy is all about really mocking people's flaws and mocking people's mistakes and faults and, and sometimes the difficulties they get themselves into because of those foibles so foibles is quite a nice word as well so those are some of the aspects of comedy for AO4. Finally, um, why does this poem feature in a comedic or a comedy specification? Well, obviously, marriage is often a, a common feature of comedies because it presents that togetherness. It it's, it's kind of um, sums up that quest for togetherness, that quest for romantic commitment, those kind of things. But rather than um, the marriage here being seen as something pleasant and something to aspire to, that you might find in rom-coms, for example. Here, it's the fact that that relationship, that marriage is quite fractured, which is why the comedy comes from it. Um, you could also say that um, you have the pairing of quite old, quite archaic mythology with something that's much more modern, something that's much more colloquial. And that means that the poem is rooted more in the everyday. And it's maybe a satire of married life, perhaps. Because there are many, many people out there who would like to spend more time with their family but can't because of the job that they do and the salary that that provides. Um, kind of the, you know, they have to go out and earn the money. And that sometimes comes at a cost in terms of family time. So it is relatable as well. Um, you could also use this poem to talk about the foolishness of men. Um, Sisyphus being a bit of a buffoon, a bit of a, a, bit of a fool. Um, he seems to be oblivious to the never-ending... Um, you know, task, what's the point in doing your job? Well, if you're going to do it forever, you know, because, you know, you're going to be stuck there doing it forever. So he seems to be oblivious to the the fact that this is going to be going on forever. Um, the wife is also not particularly doting or sympathetic. She's not kind of waiting for him and saying how heroic he is or how brave he is, or how thankful she is for him working so hard for her. She's actually very mocking, sarcastic, mimicking him, uh, calling him names, like we've said, like Burke and Jerk, talking a lot of old bollocks, all these kind of things. She's very pissed off with him, isn't she? Um, and the social satire of married life 
and presentation of human foibles, shortcomings, flaws, and so on. Um, but you can also say that there's a feminist slant. So Duffy is a feminist poet. She's using this poem to really talk about female experience and to historically look at that as well, because history is often about men and often about victorious, successful men or dictators and, and things, uh, people who had success at one point or another. And therefore, she's really kind of trying to debunk, I suppose, masculinized history and giving it a new female perspective. And what she's, I suppose, saying is that in history, there were hundreds, if not thousands of wives or, or daughters or women who have been sidelined because of their uh, because of the men's um, victory and their power and their influence. So she's really trying to 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 reevaluate, um, you know, female experience in this poem as well. And that would come under AO3. So that is the poem, Mrs. Sisyphus, quite a short poem, quite a simple poem, really, all about how a husband is neglecting his wife and instead focusing on his work. Thank you.